Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, we're going to talk today about cocktails and about Robert's new book, which is um, covers an exciting um, change in the last actually 20 plus years, the cocktail renaissance, the cocktail revival. It goes by a few different names depending on who you talk to. But I thought we'd start out by, for, for those who are, aren't quite sure what that means, what is the cocktail renaissance of the recent decades? What is that exactly? Uh, the cocktail renaissance has been this uh period of time, uh, which has happened intensely over the last 15 years and uh, somewhat less intensely over the last 30 years, uh, where um, a group of bartenders sort of reclaimed their profession, um, bringing it back from just a, a, a paycheck job, you know, a placeholder that you did while you were waiting to do something else, and turning it back into what it had been in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, a respected member of the community, you know, that had a set of skills and that, that everyone looked up to. Um, and along with that, uh, figuring out how to uh, make uh, the drinks and the cocktails correctly, how to make them with quality products, with say fresh juice instead of sour mix, um, with good uh, spirits instead of like bottom shelf rod cut. And um, so it, it all kind of came together and uh, it took a number of years, but it, it finally got here. It was like the last thing to be uh, brought back and revived properly in terms of culinary aspects in America. Uh, we went through the food revolution and the beer revolution and the wine revolution, but eventually we got to cocktails. Um, and uh, that is what the book is about, how that happened, why that happened, and who was involved. So why did you decide to write this book now, at this particular time? Um, I, uh, I, I decided, uh, I, I wanted, well I didn't decide, I wanted to write the book four years ago and I went to my publisher and after a little convincing they said yes. I wanted to write it because I didn't see anyone else writing it and I was afraid, um, if you write about liquor and cocktails, and you particularly write from a historical point of view, you learn a few things very quickly. And one of the things is that a lot of the history wasn't written down. Um, all the cocktail historians, and there are what, five or six of them in the whole world, um, they spent a lot of time trying to figure out where the cocktails come, came from, the history of the bartender. And they had to go dig in uh, old newspapers and old out of print books. And it took a very long time to piece together this history. It had all been lost. And I found it intolerable that we would lose what had happened in the last 30 years just because, I mean, it's, it's, it's thoroughly documented um, in the internet age. But that doesn't mean that everybody put all the pieces together in one like book or document so that um, people would remember it. And as you can imagine, you know, history that is written in bars gets forgotten because everyone's drinking. Um, and, if it, and I experienced that as I interviewed the bartenders for this book. Uh, not everyone remembered everything the same way and I had to figure out it was like Rashomon all the time and it was like, okay, what actually happened? It's somewhere in the middle there, you know, and I'm going to write it down and someone's not going to be happy with this account, but it's as close as I can get to the truth. Um, so that's why I decided to do it. Yeah. So if you had to pinpoint a time and place, where and when would you say the cocktail revival started? Uh, it's a little difficult to say, and it's different for every city. Uh, the book concentrates basically on three cities, uh, New York, San Francisco, and London as being the major cities that got the cocktail revival going. And in each city it began differently and at different times. If you're talking about New York, it really uh, kind of kicked off when a man named Dale DeGroff was asked to take charge of the cocktail program in the Rainbow Room when they reopened the Rainbow Room at top of Rockefeller Center in 1987. Um, he kind of worked in isolation for a very long time. Some people were paying attention to what he did and a lot of people wrote about it, um, but there wasn't another important cocktail bar in New York until Milk and Honey, which some of you might have heard of a very famous uh, bar on the Lower East Side that kicked off the whole speakeasy thing, came along in 2000. Um, here in San Francisco, it's even more complicated. Um, there were some early figures. There was a guy named uh, Tony Abu Ghanan who got his start at the uh, Bilbao Cafe that some of you may have heard of. 
Um, and then he was the head bartender when they opened, reopened the Starlight Room at the top of the Francis Drake Hotel. And the Starlight Room was sort of like um, the Rainbow Room here, right, right. basically, right. isn't it? Yeah, you know. scale, hotel, yeah. And uh, they did the same thing that the Rainbow Room is that they, uh, they put the bartender on a pedestal and they said, pay attention to this guy, he knows what he's doing as much as our chef does. So Tony Abuganan was one of the guys who got it going and we're talking in the late 90s. And then there was another guy named Paul Harrington who worked at the townhouse in Emeryville and Enrico's when it used to exist. Um, and he was a real cocktail scholar. He, all these people without exception would seek out the old books that had been, that had gone out of print when Prohibition came and then uh, would comb through them and uh, try to figure, well, how do I make a widow's kiss and how do I make a sidecar correctly so that it tastes good? Um, he was in it relatively short period. He wanted to be an architect. And so, you know, by the mid-90s, he had left the profession completely. But he left his mark. They, they made mojitos like crazy at Enrico's. And that doesn't sound so exciting right now, but once upon a time, a mojito was a revelation, you know, that you'd actually take fresh vegetables and herbs and put them at the bottom of a glass and muddle them and, you know, create these things one by one by one. And um, he, got a, he got a lot of attention, Paul Harrington, because the press, uh, like to hang out in Enrico's and drink. Um, and in particular, important to his career, was that the, uh, the, the uh, journalist that went on to create Wired magazine used to hang out there. And so when they started Wired and they created the, um, the website for Wired, which I believe was the first professional website connected to a publication, uh, they asked him to write a cocktail column in it. It was called CocktailTime.com, and this started in like 95 or 96. And this started a long connection between the cocktail revival and the rise of the internet. These two are very interconnected. Without the internet, the cocktail revival wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened as quickly. Would you agree, Virginia? Absolutely. It's yeah. so widespread now. It's, yeah, every state now you can go and find amazing bars, and I think that's largely to do with the internet. Yeah, one of the reasons why the cocktail bartending had it stagnated is because everybody was working in isolation. Right. Like if you're making, you're trying to make a good Manhattan in Seattle, you don't know someone's having that same problem in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But once the internet comes along, you get on the chat rooms, you exchange recipes, you exchange thoughts, um, and a community develops. So in in terms of New York and London, you mentioned Dale DeGroff, but um, who were some other key figures kind of in those early days that, that really pushed things forward? In New York? Yeah, in New York, and then maybe we can talk about London too a little bit since it was so important. Um, and the, well, uh, Dale DeGroff was an interesting figure. How many people have heard the name Dale DeGroff? Okay, see, <laughs> bartenders aren't famous the way chefs are. They just aren't. <laughs> Dale DeGroff is the most famous bartender, in the, and, he's, and he's not that famous, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, he's been bartending his whole life, he's 68, he's a very uh, charismatic uh, guy, he's a former actor, he used to bartend at the Bel Air down in LA, and uh, the thing about Dale DeGroff is he seems to have never spent a night at home in the past 40 years. And so all through the book are stories where young bartenders trying to figure out their lives and their professions and all of a sudden Dale DeGroff walks into their bar out of the blue. It's just like, and he goes, hey, how you doing? I hear you're making cocktails. Well, what can I tell you? How can I help? Here, here's a book. He was like, and, and so this happened again and again and again. And so he developed uh, protégés in this way. Um, so his three major protégés in New York was a woman named Julie Reiner who actually is from Hawaii and spent several years bartending in San Francisco before she moved to New York. She's uh, a woman who, f she started a famous bar called Flatiron Lounge and another one called Clover Club. There was another woman from Long Island named Audrey Saunders. Uh, she, had a, uh, she had a business cleaning carpets at offices and celebrities' homes and she Strangely enough, she didn't like that job, um, and she wanted to do something else. So she went to one of Dale DeGroff's classes and said, um, I'll work for you for free. I just want to do something else. I love bartending. And, and she did work for free for many years. And then she opened a bar called the Pegu Club. And then there was a New Yorker named Sasha Petrasky. He's the man who founded Milk and Honey 
and uh, he was an interesting fellow. He grew up in Greenwich Village. Um, uh, he, would, he grew up in a communist household, so he had a very interesting perspective on capitalism. Um, and also, during the weekends, he saw the bridge and tunnel people come in and trash his neighborhood every weekend. And he said, one day I'm going to open a bar, you know, where we don't have an effect on the neighbors. And that's what he did. He created this secret bar, and you had to know it was there. It had no address. You didn't know where it was. You had to text in order to get a reservation. Then he'd text back and say it was okay to come. Uh, this, of course, made it very notorious and catnip for the media. Um, so those were three of the early figures. Mm -hmm. um, here in San Francisco, there was a man named Scott Beatty. Um, there's a restaurant called Cyrus up in Heldsville? Hillsburg. Hillsburg? It was, in Napa. yeah. Do uh, any of you guys ever been there? Anyway, it was, um, for, for its time, it was a, a famous yeah. restaurant along the lines of French Laundry, yeah, right? Fine dining, uh -huh. tasting menus only, yeah. Uh, he took it's advantage wonderful. of his surroundings. Uh, he figured, I'm in Napa Valley, and everybody has these wonderful mm, herbs and orange groves and fruit groves and vegetables, and I'm going to take all this and just stuff it into the glass. So his cocktails were, were like works of art. They had like wheels of orange and tufts of mint and tufts of rosemary, and um, it was like chartreuse in a glass, every single cocktail. Um, so he was important, and he got one of the first book deals. And then there, um, there was a guy named Marco Dionysus, who actually was from, he wasn't from Portland, but he made his name in Portland. And then he, this was before Portland was cool like it is today. And he was impatient, so he came down to San Francisco and he started the cocktail program at a place called Absinthe, which still exists. That was the first really important modern craft cocktail program in San Francisco, 1997. Every drink on the menu. Um, had a heritage. It had the date it was created, who created it, what was in it, and that really turned a corner in San Francisco. There's always been a big difference between the San Francisco uh, scene and the New York scene. Um, as uh, Camper English, a journalist friend of ours, put it rather derogatorily, um, the New York bartenders just pour things out of bottles and that's what they know how to do. Um, whereas you guys uh, use fresh produce and know how it changes from season to season, week to week to day to day, and that changes the way you make cocktails, so it's all about freshness. That has changed a little bit over the years. There's a kind of a sameness now. Everyone makes the same cocktails wherever you go in America. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a little bit of that in San Francisco, yeah. isn't yeah. there? Yeah. We just have so much accessibility, so we get spoiled that way, and I think there's more to play with um, mm -hmm. throughout the year. And it's, it's like, what kind of lemon are you using? Is it Meyer? Is it, you know, we get down into those details where you don't see that as much mm -hmm. in other bars. They don't get quite as geeky about every single detail, but it does happen. Yeah. And there's very spiritist bars here as well that are yeah. just booze out of a bottle as well and focus that way. So it, it goes both ways, but. Yes, yeah. including all the whiskey bars. The, whi the whiskey revival is part and parcel with the whole cocktail revival. Mm -hmm. um, the bourbon and rye people saw what bartenders were doing and said like, oh, people actually care about our spirits now and, um, and they want good bourbon and they want good rye and they will use it in cocktails. So it's kind of, they walked hand in hand into this. Yeah. I think that's maybe one, not to detour too much, but one interesting subject is how it's changed the spirits world as well over the last decade plus, is there's so many more distillers now, um, dozens, hundreds more, and, um, and also the price of spirits have, has gone up so much for mm -hmm. those of us that follow it, but I don't, I don't know if there's any like whiskey fans or collectors or the rest here, um, but I think that's one interesting change that's happened that really is due to the cocktail revival as well in, in a large part. Yes. There's a greater demand for all of this. And a lot of that started out here on the West Coast, right. a lot of those micro distillers. Mm -hmm. And when these micro distillers got started, uh, they really wanted to get their products in the hands of these bartender influencers because mm -hmm. they became influencers. The, the liquor company started going to the bartenders and saying, what do you think of my new product? Do you like it? Should I go back to the drawing board? Will you carry it? Will you use it? As opposed to like 25 years ago when they would say, I got a new product. You should carry it. <laughs> and I'll buy you a television. <laughs> and that's all they cared about, their opinion. They didn't think much of them. So it's really changed everything.
Yeah, and there's yeah. those key, you know, St. George and Hubert Germain Robin and or Germain Robin craft distillers now, but those that back since the 80s here in the Bay Area have been yes. so important. Um, Indeed. To kind of and there's so much about seasonality and local, you know, local sourcing for their gins and mm-hmm. the rest as well, or the or the grapes that Germain Robin are grown around the vineyards in Ukiah. So, so I feel like all this has trickled into many areas, but. Um, but yeah, yeah I, actually, that's one thing I was thinking about. How would you say this has trickled down across the country? Because, of course, then there's these cities we don't think of for cocktails like uh, Tulsa or the rest. But we can find, go middle America and find speakeasies and these kind of bars now. So how do you think the rest of the country specifically has been affected by what has really started on the coasts? Well, well like with a lot of things, uh, the middle of America looks to the coast to see what they're doing. And they, they take their uh, tips culturally and culinarily uh, from there. And so it would trickle, it's not trickle down, it's like trickle in, into yeah. the rest of the country. And then the rest, uh, so after San Francisco and New York started getting their thing going, that Chicago did and LA, and now you get the, the secondary cities and the tertiary cities where you can find one or two or three good cocktail bars. And it's kind of funny, they have to go through the same growing pains, you know, they. They start off rather self-important and pretentious, just like New York and San Francisco were at the beginning. And then they eventually figure out that doesn't work so well. And then they, they get back to the hospitality part. They, they just have to go through the same baby steps over and over again. I'm sure you've had this experience yes. going to other cities and you're just like, oh, this feels like San Francisco five years ago. Yeah, I'll say, oh, <laughs> they just got their first speakeasy and yeah. it's real snobby and passwords and exclusive. and Yes, and they're making a barrel-aged cocktail. And like, <laughs> yeah, or you think mm-hmm. like Denver with Sean Kenyon, who's a major figure in the cocktail world and a bar manager there. He had his speakeasy a few years ago and took Denver by storm and now I go back and he's opened the Occidental and it's you know, it's arcade games and flat screens with uh, sports, and mm-hmm. uh, it, and you know they kind of go through that phase where they're well, we were snobby and fancy, and now we're just over it. And yeah. So you see that, but New York and San Francisco have gone through those phases a few times over. Right. <laughs> I'd right. say, yeah. Um, what are some bars that have been specific bars around the country that have been really surprising or or um, unexpected for you? A surprising or unexpected? Hmm. Yeah. Stood out. Uh, I mean, you have to go through time, and like there was a time where uh, the m- so-called molecular mixology bars were surprising because they were doing outlandish things with flames and and, and hydrogen, mm-hmm. and um, has like what's is there a proponent in San Francisco of that style? There really wasn't. There was a couple of people that tried to start it, and it never really took. San yeah. Francisco didn't find it quite real enough. I, I kind of wish it would would have, just as another element. Yeah. But Has anyone ever been to a place called Aviary in Chicago? Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so they go to great lengths to make a cocktail. It's, it's amazing. It's like every cocktail is a science experiment. Um, and... Uh, those 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 kind of bars are good in their way. I mean, as long as the drinks taste good, who cares how they made them? Right. Um, and uh, surprise, well, and then uh, cocktail bars. It became such a big business that they became events, event bars. That um, I mean, they were the interior design was was done within an inch of its life, and there was usually a theme. The epitome of this is this bar in uh, New York called the Dead Rabbit. Uh, Grog and Grocery, and they wanted to create this bar that was supposed to be like 1850s in New York City. Um, and on the bottom part, it was like where like the young, the young immigrant Irish toughs would drink, you know, and they'd have their whiskey and beer. And then if you were like, you know, a bon vivant who had like a diamond stick pin in your tie, you'd go upstairs and you'd have the fancy dancy cocktails. And, uh, and it's, it's done very well, um, and it's quite an experience, and the cocktails are good. It does kind of feel like a theme park every now and then. Mm -hmm. Um, Those same people have opened a place called Blacktail recently, which is supposed to be like what a bar would be in Havana during Prohibition. So there's always been this big fantasy element because we're all just trying to imagine what drinking used to be. Um, (laughs) And that's why bartenders, you know, they... They couldn't help themselves. They get the vest, you know, they get the mustache wax, you know. they. The tattoos are modern, but um, anyway, it was just they were dressing the part, and it can seem foolish, but you have to remember they were just, you know, it's just like dress the part, be the part. You know, if you're going to embrace this 
And if you're going to ask for respect, you know, it's like, I'm a bartender, look at me. This is what a bartender dresses like. They eventually are stopping dressing like that, but there's nothing wrong with a bartender looking spiffy behind the bar. Right. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's well, pleasant. Find, yeah, there's a part of it that, like you said, it gets a little silly and it's trendy for sure, but... But I think I, I've always been kind of a retro old school girl. And I think one thing I love is that this crowd draws some of people who really respect the past. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of geeks and they dig into their history. And so sometimes that translates to dress and they listen to a lot of jazz and they, mm -hmm. you know, collect vinyl. And I, I find that it attracts that kind of person. Vinyl does seem to be a big thing <laughs> in the bartender <laughs> world. Yeah. It's not a given, but it does seem to attract that well, crowd. Well, it's all about authenticity, you know, right. they're, just, they're just chasing after that. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, we were we were asked to talk about how you can know whether you're in a good bar or not. <laughs> Just some ways, like you know, if you walk into these cocktail bars, it can be a little intimidating, and and that's a shame. It shouldn't be that at all. Remember, they're there to serve you. They they want you there, and they want you to be happy and come back. Um, but, you know, they, they look beautiful, the bartenders are sometimes dressed very well, they, they well, every, everything about a bartender is intimidating in a way. He's standing, he's in charge, or she's in charge. Um, so, but, but there are also a lot of charlatans out there and a lot of wannabes and people who are doing it wrong. And there's, what's Wayne Curtis's phrase? Um, oh. All mustache, no merit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so... What would be the first thing you go to? You would go to more bars than I do, I think, because <laughs> you're just uh, you're on the road all the time and you see more cities. What's the first thing you look for when you go in a bar? How do you know you're in the right place? Well, I actually check the websites ahead of time and look at the menu, and I, I get frustrated if I can't see a, an example of a menu because I just want to look for either a little originality or a focus with a cocktail menu. Uh -huh. If I start to feel like it's all over the place or yeah. looks like a copycat of everything else, then right, I start right. to worry. Um, that but they've pieced together their menu from yeah. other people's menus by looking on or the Or a web. consultant, which is a thing these days. Ah. Cocktail consultants are a dime a dozen, and they come and put together menus, and there's not really a bar manager necessarily doing that uh -huh. but when I walk into the bar I'm I'm looking I love both dives and upscale bars so I actually look at the spirits behind the bar I look to see is it a thoughtful selection do they have a nice mix of, mm -hmm. of small and big brands obscure spirits or if they're focused on Italian Amaro let's say is it just Fernet and a couple big bar you know Chinar or do they have some interesting some a, a broader range what's if they claim to have that focus yeah so I kind of look for those kinds of things I look at the back bar too although sometimes it's a case of like they've collected all the right tools but they don't know how to use them that's right <laughs> so you have to look out for that uh, I was talking with some bartenders recently and um, they were saying that they thought uh, um, one of the most the, t the two most important things in a bar, it doesn't have anything to do with the drinks or the menu. You walk in and it's the music mm. and the lighting. Um, if the music seems thoughtful and right for the place, if it's not too loud, that it actually contributes and doesn't take away from the idea of conversation. And, and if the lighting, you know, makes the bar look attractive, but more importantly, makes the people in the bar look attractive. <laughs> then you know that they've thought through everything. And then as we were talking, we came up with a third thing, which is actually as important, temperature. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Who wants to be in a hot bar or an incredibly chilly bar? It's gotta be the perfect right temperature because that puts you at ease. Why do you go into a bar to relax? You know, at the end of a day, um, if the temperature's wrong, you're not gonna do that. So those are some things I look for. Yeah, on the service, menu, right? Service, this, of course. This is a whole you should big discussion. be given a greeting. <laughs> yeah. um, within how long? Thirty seconds, Ideally, I think. Right away. Yeah. yeah, there should you walk in. That bartender's like better see you, and if they're busy, just say hello. Be right with you. If you're sitting standing there at the, if you're sitting at the stool for like five minutes and nobody's acknowledging you, you already feel bad, mm -hmm. and they've already failed. Um, and also, not just the hello, but you don't have your drink yet, but cocktail napkin right in front of you. Um, somebody put this really well. I forget who it was. That's your patch of real estate. 
they've given you a piece of land in their bar, it belongs to you, there's going to be a drink on that cocktail napkin, and so you feel like you're part of the bar. So there's that, and glass of water. Mm -hmm. Bars where you keep ordering drinks and you still don't get the glass of water, it's either one of two things. They are inattentive, right. they're not doing their job, or they're cheap. <laughs> they don't want to give you water because they want you to order only drinks that actually cost money. Or so there's a drought, both, yeah. which we do face in California, but you still, oh, you're supposed to get it if well, you ask for it. <laughs> if you ask for it, okay. Oh, so do, so do bars not do it out of conscientiousness here? Yeah, it's true. But oh. you are supposed to ask and then get it right away. So okay. yeah, we've been going through that the last year, year plus, yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yes, they did ask last night whether I wanted glass so water. So that's why. But yeah, I prefer it when yeah. they ask me, actually, because then I don't have to... Right. Think about it. <laughs> um, as far as the menu's concerned, uh, when I go to a new bar um, and I feel uh, duty bound to order their original drinks because that's, you know, the flag they've put in the sand, uh, there's a certain way that people read menus and their eyes go to the top left corner. <laughs> and so find the drink there. That drink is there for a reason. Um, they're either they're really proud of it, they think it's good and you should drink it, or they think it's going to have a lot of public appeal and a lot of people are going to order it. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to get a gauge on the place. Okay, this is, you know, this is their badge, this is what they're saying, we serve this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I always start there. So um, that's, a, that's a good tip. That's one of my rules of thumb, too, because it's like a restaurant. You're not going to go to a Peruvian restaurant and then ask for something that's Mexican. So I kind of think the same with the bar. It's like, well, what's your specialty when yeah. they kind of ask me? You know, it's like, that's what I want to focus on. But of course, I drink everything. So, you know, I guess if there's something you hate, you want to outline that to them. But I think it's a, a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good idea to read the bar. Not every bar is right for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if if you go into a sports bar and they got the latest game on and you go up and you order, um, what? A sidecar? Ramos Gin Fizz. Uh, or Ramos Gin Fizz. You're an idiot. You're going to have a bad time. Uh, they're going to make you a bad Ramos Gin Fizz. They're going to hate you because you asked for a Ramos Gin Fizz when you walked into a sports bar instead of getting a beer. It says, get a beer. But um, if you go into a cocktail bar and they're obviously proud and it's like, we make cocktails well. And then you ask you for order a vodka a tonic. Yeah, and you ask for a vodka. <laughs> no, they should make you the vodka tonic sure. and they should smile. Um, <laughs> but why not take advantage of what the bar is? Right. You know, it's like uh, not, not every bar is for every occasion or every mood. That's so, right. um, yes. So it's, a, it's somewhat up to you as well if you're going to have a good time in your bar. And we have a few more minutes before we'll take questions, but, but yeah. maybe getting into some specifics with San Francisco, uh -huh. um, let's talk s a few specific bars. Um, what do you think in terms of iconic or longtime bars? What are ones that have made a real impression on you here? Uh, the, uh, the important cocktail bars, they, they, for some reason they haven't tended not to stick around as much here. Um, bar Agricole is a restaurant, but it's an important mm -hmm. bar. Mm -hmm. It's run by a guy named Thad Vogler who also owns True Normand. He's a very opinionated, very principled guy. Uh, he only carries liquors and spirits that he approves of, uh, not just taste-wise, but ethically. Right. You know, the way it's made and where it comes from. And so when you look at his back bar, there aren't many bottles back there, and you probably don't know any of them. Um, I mean, he says, you know, if it's a big brand and it's well advertised, chances are it's probably bad. You know, so, uh, and he has his own way of doing things. Um, so I think he sets up a really interesting example, one that I don't think many follow because it's too difficult. Um, Trick Dog is an important bar that our friend over here was <laughs> discovered by accident and uh, found that every drink she ordered was excellent, correct? Mm -hmm. um, that's by a group called the Bon Vivants, which is made of uh, three gentlemen. Is that yeah, right? It started that way. And mm -hmm. Now they've got a whole staff around the country, but mm -hmm. all San Francisco guys started it originally. It's a good example of a bar that has tried to do uh, things very well, very exquisitely, but putting on no airs, no pretension. It just feels like a bar when you go in there. You just can get really great drinks. 
and they also have these thematic uh, menus that they bring out with a, a lot of fanfare every six months. The current one is based on politics, presidential politics right, or something like that. Right. I haven't yeah. seen this one yet, but... Uh, yeah, the but past they've had ones. menus based on the Zodiac. They have a menu that looked like a Chinese Chinese menu. food menu. Chinese yeah. food <laughs> menu. Um, the first Dog one, calendar. The first one was based on a, a Pantone pe uh, paint wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and in, in each each cocktail was named after one of the weird colors. That you got the, a swatch the, yeah. when you got in the bar with your drink yeah. on each. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they've been influential, not just in terms of the way they do things, but also they've gotten a lot of attention. They're kind of a good blueprint on how you became you become a nationally famous bar in a city. And uh, I think one thing with the Bon Vivants is they've been very humanitarian focused or giving back focused as well, so they've got a lot of attention for that. They've thrown these pig and yeah. punch, now swig and swine. Pig swig and, and punch. swine, pig and punch, yes. They, they, they do charitable events. Yeah, um, that they're famous um, for they're, as they're well. They're festivals that have like roast pig and punch, lots of punch. Um, and uh, Historically speaking, there's a restaurant in uh, Richmond called Tommy's Mexican Restaurant. Yeah. Um, who whistled? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> if no, you want to know why uh, you're able to get better tequila um, or better mezcal these days, uh, that restaurant is a big part of the answer. Uh, the owner, Julio Bermejo, started making his margaritas with 100% agave uh, tequila instead of like crappy tequila uh, back in the early 90s and 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 it's he he got rid of the uh, triple sec because he wanted people to taste the tequila and not taste anything else and that became the Tommy's margarita and the Tommy's margarita is served all over the nation um, so he became an evangelist for tequila which you know back in the 80s and 90s was thought of as um, I don't know like a bad choice, you know, uh, the kind of choice you made late at night and you drank too much of it and you felt bad in the morning and you never drank it again. It was, it was a dangerous spirit that college students drank. Um, but now it's become respected and people sip it tequila and they talk about it and they even drink mezcal and they know that it doesn't have to have a worm in it and that kind of thing. So if you haven't been, go. It's mediocre Mexican food, um, but you can get a Tommy's margarita made at Tommy's, and and they have like the best selection of tequila in the city, don't they? Oh yeah, it's over over 300 was the last count I heard, but I think it's more than that. And they have a lot of things under the shelf that are no longer being made. So if you just ask for the special off the rack stuff or the things you can't see from behind the bar, they can offer you some very special tequilas. San Francisco is a cool place because unlike New York, um, you never really forgot cocktail culture. It was on a low flame, and it, but it kept burning through the 70s and 80s. There were places, if you wanted to find them, that made good cocktails. Um, and there are places like, you know, like the Buena Vista is famous for one cocktail, the Irish coffee. And, and, uh, and so it held on to it a little bit. And there's always been a big history here with, um, you know, spirits from Latin America, like mm -hmm. tequila, and also because of the uh, Italian population, people have always drunk Negronis here, mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So it's, it's a special place bar-wise and drinking-wise. Yeah, there are bars like Zam Zam that have been going strong since the 40s. Been there yet. Oh my goodness, you should go. It's very special. Has anyone else been to Zam Zam? Yes, okay, great. And like the Tonga Room? That's an old TV yeah, place. Yeah, Tonga Room was designed yeah. by a Hollywood guy back in the 40s, and it looks like a movie set. Um, it's pretty unbelievable. Is that Steve Crane? Steve Crane place? Um, no, 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 it's no. Yeah, it's, well, it's hotel. It's a pretty hotel kind of situation. So the drinks aren't. They had a revamp a couple years ago. Don yeah. Ronan helped them, consulted with the Fairmont Hotels. But. But uh, it's a tough, it's not the best drinks and they're expensive, but he improved them quite a bit. Yeah. But the space is one of a kind. They say it's the last in the country left of those, those great expansive. It's got a pool in the middle where a boat floats back uh -huh. and forth with a band on it and plays yacht rock. <laughs> and, right. and it looks like you've stepped into a tiki movie set. I guess that's one other aside because that has some strong ties locally. But the tiki revival has kind of brought rum. Rum has been the latest craze, I'd say, the last two, three years around the country. Yeah, the tiki drinks are one of the last category of cocktails to be brought back because um, well, they had been in eclipse for many decades and people, even bartenders, mixologists, tended to think of them as silly, sugary, rummy drinks, you know, with umbrellas in them and 
we're trying to get people to respect us, and they're not going to respect us if we give them a drink with an umbrella in. <laughs> but um, there was a historian named Jeff Berry who did the research and got the original recipes for all these old tiki drinks like the Mai Tai and the zombie and the painkiller. Um, and once he got the real raw material, everyone started to see, oh yes, these, these were actually once well-crafted drinks. Um, they, they weren't, you know, crap made with a sour mix um, and, and bad rum and Bacardi. Uh, sorry, Bacardi. Uh, um, and uh, the, 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 sh the greatest shining example of the Tiki Revival here in town, Smuggler's Cove. Um, you, will, you will see it in all its glory there. Uh, so, and I believe there's another tiki bar open recently by the, the future bars? Um, yes, that's a Pagan Idol. That yeah. one's in the financial district, and it's a crazy environment, too. Uh -huh. It's got, uh, yeah, pyrotechnic kind of lights and a volcano in the back, and the front areas looks like a ship, the hull of a ship, and yeah. it's, it's pretty fun in there. It <laughs> yeah. is, it is. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, I think um, the, the, now it's kind of, turned over on its head. Uh, the cocktail revival owes a lot to tiki. Um, people have been going crazy with garnishes lately. Like the creativity has gone from inside the glass to outside the glass. And that's totally taken from tiki. And also with the, all these thematic bars like Dead Rabbit and Black Tail, mm -hmm. it's, you know, a fantasy world. And tiki was always about that. You, you walk in and it's like, you're, you're not in San Francisco anymore. You're on some Pacific Isle. Um, so that's that. And I was going to say, historically, actually talking about tiki, the roots are from California, oh, yeah. both yes. here and Los the Angeles. Beachcomber. Yes, yep. yes, San Francisco, home of Trader, Trader Vicks. Has everyone Anyone ever been to the Trader Vicks in Emeryville? Any good? <laughs> Should I visit? Yes? Okay. It's historic. I guess this is disputed, but supposedly the invention of the Mai Tai. Um, was it's not Trader disputed. Vicks. No, his, it's, it's the his. style of Mai Tai, right? Uh, so some people claim to. Well, Don <laughs> the Beachcomber claimed right. that uh, Trader Vic stole it from him, but <laughs> most historians <laughs> side with Trader Vic. Yeah. Mai Tai's his. Well, it's his. Bay Area, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so why don't we open to questions? Anybody have any questions about anything? Um, so everything's craft now. Craft this, craft that. Uh, what about these things like tonic and these other categories that people are going craft in? Is that really like elevating drinks or are we just, have we gone too far sort of down the craft road? Um, well, taking tonic as an example, I'd, I'd say yes. I, I know people get annoyed by the craft term now. It just means that they're taking a little care to make it as opposed to some assembly line process. Um, the tonic water that we were using, you know, from Canada Dry or Schweppes, it, it, it didn't have any quinine in it, um, and it was very sweet. Um, if you've ever been to London and had the tonic water over there, it's, it's more dry and bitter. So have you had like a gin and tonic with like store-bought and then one of the fancier brands? No. Well, compare them side by side and see what you think. Uh, I think one with, you know, like there's Q tonic, there's Fever Tree tonic, there are actually quite a few at this point. Um, you do have to pay a little extra for it uh, because they are small businesses. I, I won't drink a gin and tonic with like Canada Dry anymore. It doesn't taste good. I mean, it just tastes sort of like a little sweet kind of sodary beverage. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases though, the craft thing always you know, goes overboard. I'm not exactly sure whether we need uh, craft simple syrup, you know? <laughs> you know what simple water. syrup is sugar and water. <laughs> I can make some right here. <laughs> and it tastes as good as anything you buy on the shelf. Uh, so... But I mean, if you're using craft sugar... And ah! <laughs> but simple syrup goes inside a cocktail, and once it gets in there, are you really going to notice that taste anymore? It's sort of like the vodka in a cosmopolitan. You can use Belvedere, Grey Goose, whatever you want to use, is spurned up. Once it's in the cocktail, you lose all those nuances. It's just vodka. Yeah. Um, the top left menu thing was cool. Do you have any other tips and tricks to navigating cocktail menus? Like, I always, I feel like I sort of like everything, and so I look at a menu and I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea how to figure out what to order. Yeah, the menus can be pretty uh, large and intimidating. Um, do you have a general idea of the kind of things you like to drink, or do you like to drink most things? 
<laughs> well, yeah, no, that's true. They're trying to be helpful, but yeah. I too get annoyed by that question. I said, like, you know, what do you recommend? And he says, and they throw it right back at you. Why, well, what do you like to drink? And it's like, and I always tell them, I like to drink everything because I do, and I really just want to know what they think they make well. Right. But they're not going to tell you that because I wish they'd be more honest. Like, you know, I really like this drink. I think it's spectacular. We do this well. Um, I guess you just have to throw it back in their lap, you know, and it's just like, I'd like, but they also do hate that question. What, the, don't ask them, what do you drink? Because they hate that question. Um, what's, well, how, how do you crack that nut? I do, some, I push it back on them. I don't ask them what they drink because they do hate that, but I'll say, you know, what do you think is really exciting on your menu right now? Or what is, sometimes even what is the most popular drink on your menu right now so I can see what everyone's ordering if it's my first time at the bar. But that's not always the most interesting to me either. What's popular might be the vodka drink and I don't want that. But, but I ask those questions and I'll, I'll kind of dig a little deeper and I'll say, or if they force me to, I'll pick a mood and go, well, you know, something bitter sounds great right now and then we narrow it down to a couple if you give the bartender a sign that you're inquisitive and you're really thinking about your order, um, like choose a couple drinks on the menu that are intriguing to you and ask about a specific ingredient in them. And then the, the bartender says, okay, we got a thinker. All right, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have a little conversation here. And you'll learn more, and pretty quickly, I'd say probably within a minute, you'll be able to decide where you wanna go with your order. What do you think are the most important things to have stocked in your home bar? Important things to have stocked in our home bar. In like my own home bar, like if in just, your home bar, yes. <laughs> which okay. just so you know is very minimal, but like you know in in like your own personal collection. You if you're mean, if you're trying. Uh, do you like to drink cocktails? I am learning more about them. Uh huh. Uh huh. Which is why okay. this has been helpful. Well, uh, I guess you start with the things you like to drink. So say if if you like martinis then you want to get some gin and some vermouth in your, in your back bar. Um, I mean, it's just, you sort of should start in a small, narrow place. Um, like, if suddenly you just decide, uh, I'm a Negroni girl, I'm mad about Negronis, so you're going to want the gin and the sweet vermouth and the, and the Campari there all the time. And then eventually, probably, you'll get in, you know, enough Negronis. Let's see what else I like. And um, as you drink new drinks, you say, like, I like those, so let's all have those. Um, uh, what do you think? I mean. I think sometimes if you want a little variety, too, there's this simple, like, limes are kind of genius for a few key cocktails. So it's like, let's say you have a bottle of tequila, a bottle of gin, and a bottle of uh, rum got some limes and you make some simple syrup which I make and keep in my fridge mm -hmm. then I can make a gimlet with the gin I can make a daiquiri with the a classic daiquiri with the rum and I can make a margarita with the tequila and I basically just got lime simple syrup and three bottles of spirits right and then I and then those each they're all citrusy so that you got a problem there uh, if you want something more booze forward if your mood changes but those all three taste very different depending on what spirit you have and yet you still kept it kind of simple and your, your yeah, tools are the same. That's one thing that people forget as they're like shopping for their home bar. Um, most of the classic cocktails out there are sours, meaning they have citrus in them. So like when I go home uh, on a Friday, uh, I make sure to stop by the grocery store and I, I get an orange, I get a couple lemons and I get a couple limes. I don't know what I'm gonna have when I get home, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be mad if I suddenly decide that I want a daiquiri and I didn't get any freaking limes. You know, so it's like, and I can't make the daiquiri without the limes. So you need the produce as well. So like, you'll need mints if you suddenly want mint juleps. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the same with a lot of other drinks too. So, and, and make sure you have sugar on hand. I don't know who runs out of sugar, but make sure you have sugar on hand. Um, and uh, well, you definitely need a bottle of Angostura bitters or else you're pretty much out of business. <laughs> it goes into too many things. Or good uh -huh. tonics for easy gin and tonics or things like that, vodka tonics. That's always easy. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, and uh, if you like whiskey or if you have friends who like whiskey, uh, a carefully chosen nice bottle of bourbon and a bottle of scotch, which you don't need to mix. Just pour it out and everybody, everybody's happy. Um, I usually like to drink stuff that's um, 
pretty classical cocktails like, you know, old fashions or some, such, something like that. If I'm going someplace and so it would be typically off menu, it, would that be considered like hazardous given that it's not actually like listed on the menu or would I expect most bars to be able to do you, classical You order in an old fashioned or a Manhattan or something. Yeah. Yeah, they usually don't bother. A lot of places don't bother to put it on the menu because it's so well known. Okay. Um, if you are very particular about those drinks and you like them a certain way and not another way, um, there's no problem um, asking the bartender, saying, I'm thinking about an old fashioned, how do you make it here? They'll happily tell you exactly how they make it and then you'll know, okay, I want that drink, no, I don't want that drink. Um, and uh, That's really helpful because I usually go someplace and I get it and it's not yeah. hard. And I these like days they drink. take that drink very seriously, mm -hmm. but everyone makes it slightly different. It's true. A different bitters, a different sweetener, um, even like it's, it's okay to ask like what, what bourbon do you use in your old fashioned here? What's your house bourbon? They're, 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 they don't mind answering questions like that. They like it. Okay. Yeah. They have it on tap in some places too, which is interesting. They do. Yeah. I see that a lot. I was just in Cincinnati and there was a place that had old fashions on tap. Hmm. That's because people order them too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ask a quick question then give it to you. Um, again, I'm not cool. I was the last person to discover Trick Dog, so take this with a grain of salt. But I've noticed something uh, in, on menus recently, which is shrubs mm -hmm. and sort of very like, our shrub is made with artisanal organic, blah, blah, blah. blah. So I just, <laughs> maybe you could talk a little bit about shrubs. Well, vinegar based as well as, um, it could go a couple directions, but yeah, mainly vinegar, though. Mainly vinegar, though. and Vinegar, um, fruit, and sugar. Yeah, vinegar, fruit, and sugar, exactly. And what I find, what I love about them is it often gives a real bracing kind of backbone to a drink. So even if you're getting something tall and refreshing, it'll add this nice, if, if they do it right and it's balanced, it'll add this kind of oomph to it with the vinegar. But some you get them and it's, it tastes like you're drinking kombucha or all vinegar. Yeah. And then others, you can't taste the vinegar at all. And then I say, why well, call it a shrub? But it's, it's actually a historic thing that goes back to the 1800s. Right? Yeah, at it's least 200 years. This is least. how people, they had their fruit, they didn't have it for refrigerators. How do you preserve it? You throw it in some vinegar with some sugar, and then, you know, in the spring, it, it, they just drink it. And um, it's usually used as a replacement for another acid. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have citrus in your cocktail, uh, performing the acidic uh, role, a uh, shrub will do that. And bartenders rediscovered shrubs about six or seven years ago and some make a specialty out of it. And it's a way that maybe summer fruit can last a little, little longer. I st I'm still seeing strawberry shrubs and things like that on menus right now, even though they've just gone out of season. Yeah. It preserves it a few weeks longer. But if you see something with a shrub in it on the menu, make sure you like something that you know gives you a little pucker. You know, kind of, mm, yeah. An old cocktail? Sure. Hmm. Most of the big classics have come back. Uh, there's a wonderful old cocktail uh, from like the 10s or 20s that I always like called uh, Cameron's Kick. Um, it's, uh, it's got orgeat in it, which is an almond syrup. It's got lemon juice and I believe a combination of bourbon and scotch. Is that right? That sounds right, yeah. And that's, it seems, it's an odd duck, you know, because it's a whiskey sour but with orgeat slipped in, which is something you associate with tiki drinks. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of bartenders who like this drink, and you see it pop up every now and then. Mm -hmm. The problem was it was never really a classic, it's just a minor drink. But minor drinks from the past have come back, um, like the Jungle Bird, a completely obscure tiki drink that is all over the place now. So that's one I'd like to see. What would you like to see come back there, Virginia? Oh, goodness, well. <laughs> I'd have to think about this for a minute, but I was going to say one thing that you know, a modern classic that I loved in the last section of your book. At the end of his book, there's a section on cocktails that you think maybe did yeah, deserve that, a little yeah, more recognition. Yeah, that I hope that will become modern classics. Yes. Yeah, and one is um, Owen Westman's uh, Lafroig project, and uh, I remember that yeah. at Bourbon and Branch when it first opened, when Owen was still bartending there, and I used to get that one all the time, and I loved it. It was like a sensation for a nanosecond in San Francisco. Yeah. For a year, everyone was drinking the Lafroig project, which <laughs> is. Um, um, a little Laphroaig, uh peaty whiskey. It's got yellow chartreuse, green chartreuse, lemon juice or lime juice? I think it's lemon. It's in the back of the yeah, book. Yeah, it's in the book. Um, <laughs> um, delicious drink. 
expensive drink. Um, you need expensive stuff uh, like the, the Laphroaig and the Chartreuse and the Chartreuse is like going to set you back 150 bucks just to make the drink. And that's why you don't see it on menus anymore. Right. Um, but it is really, really delicious. Yeah, I love that you included that one because that would be that's one I miss at the it penicillin time yeah. too. I kind of thought I liked the guy it who almost made as it much. Was Australian. He worked at Bourbon and Branch for a while, but then he got homesick and he went back to Melbourne, and he took the drink with him. I guess they drink it a lot in Melbourne now. What legal front still exists? There were a lot for a while. Uh, prohibition left a, a nasty residue all, all over the legal system in this country. Uh, Weird laws, not just things like you couldn't open your bar on Sunday or, or liquor stores couldn't open on election day. There was like one weird uh, law in the South, one of those southern states, South Carolina, I think, where you could only mix cocktails out of those little mini liquor bottles. Um, I, I guess this was supposed to impede drinking. You had problems here in San Francisco. There was yes. one point where the health department started cracking down and saying that inf infusions, or you put something in a spirit to flavor it, were illegal. And this was like a crisis for a while until some politician got it overturned or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Distillers Guild and a few different groups were working on it. There was another time in New York where like the health department came in and said, oh my god, you're making drinks with raw eggs and we're <laughs> shutting you down. <laughs> And uh, so there were a lot, but they're mainly gone now. They're mainly gone, these legal hurdles, aren't they? Yeah, there's Most still been a few weird ones. I mean, we've had some recent successes in California in terms of now distilleries are actually able to sell their own bottles at their distillery and, you know, do that oh, sort yeah, of that thing. Oh, yeah, that was totally unfair. You know, in crazy. the wine country, you go to the winery and, of course, you get a tasting. You can drink there. Mm -hmm. It took so long for the distillers to get the same privilege. But now you can go there and, you know, have a little sip of their wares and decide whether you want to want to buy it while you take a tour of the distillery. But there are still states like Oklahoma. They're the three-tiered system and there's very things where I have a high markup. There are mm -hmm. still a lot of issues with spirits in some states that I think it makes it tough for the bars because they pay so much more for their their And you do have the control spirits. states. <laughs> yeah. um, the states, they, the control states don't want to give that up. Mm -hmm. It's too much money. Uh, it's ridiculous that, I mean, Pennsylvania has been laboring under this ridiculously arcane um, system where you can only buy liquor through the state, mm -hmm. and the state buys what it chooses to buy. <laughs> so bartenders basically have to smuggle in this stuff from other states, you know, that they want to use in their drinks. Mm -hmm. I don't see that going away. Unfortunately. For the states that still have it. I think it's about 16 states are still, uh, yeah. All the mm -hmm. liquor is bought through the state and you have to go to package stores. Right. Yeah. Um, One more? Anything like, how do um, you A trend these, with a lot of bars these days is uh, uh, low proof cocktails, low ABV cocktails, which can be delicious. These are cocktails that are made with uh, liquors that have a lower alcohol content. Most spirits are 40% mm -hmm. or above, um, but if you're dealing with some of the liqueurs, uh, you're like 20 cent and 20 percent and below. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind starting with one of those, just to see a greater variety of what they're doing, you'll probably last one drink more. <laughs> um, don't remember the, the the brown, bitter and stirred drinks. You also get ones that are on the rocks. You can sip at them for a long time and you spend a half hour on that drink. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the ones served up, you pretty much have to drink within 10 minutes or else it goes warm. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple tips. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Robert. Thanks.